So, uh, in the interest of time, I would like to invite in this talk. I would like to uh, talk for a few minutes in the first half about. Um, I, I'm necessarily kind of representing a perspective that is taken in the U.S., but I want to talk about uh, medicinal plants used as supplements and some issues surrounding safety and efficacy and then turn for a few minutes to the idea about botanical drugs in the U.S. Um, I, I, I won't belabor this. Uh, this audience knows too well about the uh, biodiversity and the chemodiversity of plants and especially medicinal plants and the history of use. Uh, maybe one thing we haven't emphasized yet in this meeting is that a lot of our um, current understanding in, in Alpine is built around plant-derived drugs. Um, the way we think about the adrenergic nervous system and the uh, neuromuscular transmission and the culinary the way we think about all of these were largely shaped in the ancient times of, of, uh, of the experimental pharmacology, the birth of that discipline, were shaped by a lot of these uh, plant-derived alkaloids and other natural products. And importantly, importantly there was a, um, in, in that age where the experimental techniques were pretty much limited to direct gross observation, sometimes of toxicity, a lot of the things that we learned about the pharma modern pharmacology were in the context of uh, directly observed paralysis or convulsions or abolition of pain or things that were very, very uh, dramatic uh, interventions in the laboratory. Um, so, there are a lot of biological active principles there, and some of them can be detrimental, some of them can be helpful. It's a matter of dose, it's a matter of understanding how to use them, it's a matter of, um, of, understand, of developing a framework in which we can use them. And so, so those, that early framework for experimental pharmacology, I, I think, has given way to a uh, more subtle uh, look at how natural products can really intervene in cellular signaling, for example, in inflammatory processes, in, in, uh, in, in uh, understanding how uh, apoptosis is controlled, cell cycle is controlled, things like this, where, where um, I'm hopeful, and I believe it's been demonstrated, that I'm hopeful it'll even be more evident as time goes on, that we will learn how to use natural products to unravel a lot of these things and use them more wisely, more smartly in terms of the interventions that we have in, in the um, pathophysiology. And of course, the Ayurvedic and other systems of medicine have a lot to offer there, I think, insights that maybe we're not accustomed to thinking about, but that, that are, uh, I appreciated uh, Dr. Rama's talk very much, elements that we, we maybe don't have the, the same framework, but principles from natural products that can really impact these in more subtle ways and can, can really be important as we understand how to apply them. Um, so, so safety issues for medicinal plants. Thinking about the, from the supplement perspective, in the U.S., a lot of our work with the FDA, uh, Dr. Khan alluded to it, a lot of our work has to do with uh, their interest in trying to protect against um, you know, some type, some plant toxicity, against some uh, adulteration, some uh, mislabeling that might lead to, uh, to a safety issue in the market. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this except to say that you can think about some of these cases as they're just frank adulterations. They're companies that take uh, plant material, they take some chemical that they buy from wherever that's cheap, they spike it into the plant material, they sell it as a stimulant, for example, or as a, you know, something for aging or something for uh, sexual uh, performance. Uh, you know, a lot of the so-called herbal Viagras turn out to have a lot of Viagra in them. Uh, and so, so, but those things are by and large going to go by the wayside in, in the U.S. Uh, I'm not saying they'll, 
that, that they'll 100% disappear. But I mean, companies who do this, they're not going to last. They're not going to survive very long. So we need to turn our attention really to other types of safety issues that might be there. And of course, this is a this is a more a more difficult problem because a lot of the safety issues that maybe are intrinsic to the medicinal plant may be harder to detect. They may be harder to pick up. Um, often, what happens with, even with prescription drugs, uh, even with with um, conventional prescription drugs, often uh, uh, liver toxicity signal won't show up until it's been used in hundreds of thousands of people and then you begin to see a small liver signal. And unfortunately this is the same thing that happens with some uh, medicinal, some natural products that are brought to the market. Maybe the signal is very low but, but uh, in some sensitive populations you have these reactions that will occur, maybe idiosyncratic reactions that occur. And so the question is, how do, we, how do we understand those and how do we predict those? And of course, our last speaker has already talked about the drug interactions, which are very important. So I want to I tell you about uh, some work that we did on trying to, uh, looks like my formatting is off a little bit on this slide. I apologize, it may be hard to read, but our interest is trying to figure out what might be happening in cases where you have uh, hepatotoxicity that's triggered with an herbal product, and how, we, how, how can we better understand what are factors that might predispose to these kinds of signals so that they happen not commonly, but they do show up in, in uh, the population. So we tried to do a, um, develop a mouse model where we could, we could predispose the animals to liver injury, and this is based on some work that was done by uh, Bob Roth, uh, cited there at the bottom, Bob Roth at Michigan State uh, no, a number of years ago, showing that with monocrotalin or other pyrolizidine alkaloids, you can greatly enhance the impact toxicity by priming animals with an inflammatory insult with LPS or something like this. And so we tried to do this with this, uh, just to try this with some herbal products, and I just wanted to show you some of these results. So you take uh, mice, you give them, in this case, green tea. We've done this with several, um, several um, uh, natural products, but these are green tea fractions given at very high doses. You don't see any liver injury at all. You take these mice and you treat them with LPS and you get a, a, a robust inflammatory process, uh, fever response, and you don't see any permanent liver injury, maybe just a little bit of a of um, a cellular signal, not much there, but you combine these together and you get serious, uh, dramatic liver injury, and in fact the animals will die in just, uh, just a few days. So this is a, I realize this is not a physiologic thing, but what we're trying to do is create a model where we can see a signal that maybe could explain why we're getting, why we would get um, some liver injury. So what we did here, just uh, treating these mice with, with uh, either vehicle or LPS or the vehicle the LPS, you give them huge doses. This is intraperitoneal now, this is intraperitoneal. So you give them the ETCG and you do get a liver injury, but if you give that orally, it looks just like the vehicle. If you, um, sorry, I've, I've got a slide missing here, but. If you, what happens if you give the EGCG and the LPS together, you get this huge liver injury. Even if you give it orally, you give the, LP, uh, give the uh, EGCG orally, and you, and you get a huge liver injury. Same thing with green tea concentrated extracts if you give them in large doses. And I'm not trying here to show the danger of green tea uh, because I don't think it is. But the problem is that the way these things are marketed in the U.S. many times, uh, People are just taking chemicals like EGCG, synthetic, spiking them into the, into the products and selling this as a super green tea, for example. Something like this could trigger uh, a, a liver injury. So we were trying to look at a couple of others. Um, this is a black cohosh, which is used in the U.S. a lot. This is a supplement for woman, women's health. And uh, there were some case reports a few a few um, years ago about 
a liver injury with black cohosh. And so we decided we'd try this in this model, and this was really very interesting. When we used uh, black cohosh, this, uh, the semi-shifuja, and look at plasma ALT and BUA, you really don't see anything happening at all. Same thing with uh, LPS. If you give the LPS, it really doesn't change anything. Same thing with another species of semi-shifuja. Nothing happens. But then here's another species that's often used and confused with black cohosh. And, if, and in this case, if you give this along with the LPS, you get this fulminant liver injury in response to that, to that um, product. And this is a case now where you had uh, uh, um, a mix-up or confusion or adulteration of different species of semisifuga that appeared in the market and maybe we're giving the problem that we're seeing with the, with the liver injury in that case. Um, so, so I just want to mention from that standpoint, the idea here is to try to develop models that would allow us to just pick up a signal or to explain a signal that might be appearing in the human population. So our hope would be then to turn, look when we do see liver injury, then we can try look carefully at the history, see if there's an inflammatory insult, if there's a comorbidity disease or something like that, infectious disease or something like that that might be going along with it. Flipping now over to the, to the efficacy side, I want to just tell you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing there. Um, just looking at, uh, looking at some products that we were able to take into the clinic and show some, some beneficial effect. Uh, many of you have heard of echinacea, of course. This is uh, widely used in the U.S. and in Europe uh, as an immune stimulant. Um, in echinacea and in many other plants, the immune stimulant activity in the roots is uh, often affiliated, often associated with these pigmented spots in the roots. This is where melanin deposits are made. This is a cross section of the root and these are melanin deposits. If you look for the immunostimulant activity, the macrophage stimulating activity, it's located, uh, associated with these melanin spots. Um, a lot of botanicals that are known to have immune stimulant activity are very potent in this, in this assay and the, the activity is associated with this melanin fraction in the plant. This is not true of all plants. Many don't have any kind of, uh, uh, you know, very, very weak immune stimulant activity. Um, this activity appears to be mediated through toll-like receptor 2. Um, so, so if you use monoclonal antibodies to block those, those uh, receptors, you can eliminate that activity on the macrophages. And actually it turned out that in echinacea you could correlate, you could correlate the immune stimulant activity with the uh, bacterial cell load. So the more bacteria, endophytic, these are endophytic bacteria, these are not on the surface of the plant, they're inside the plant root. The, the higher the endophytic bacteria load, the more active the, the, um, um, the, the greater immune stimulant activity is there. Or another way to put it, the, the lower the dose required to give the immune stimulant activity. Um, it turns out that this activity is associated with these endophytic bacterial cell walls and they're, they're eliciting in the gut an immune response. And so I'll just show you a little bit of clinical data we did. Now this is with a different product, but it's the same, it's the same type of activity. It's the same mechanism, the same basic structure of the stimulant. So uh, it, it, this one is coming from cyanobacteria, coming from blue-green algae from spirulina is a product that you might know. And if you can, you, uh, you can give this for a week to just, these are just normal volunteers, and you can get a nice boost in the NK cell activity, natural killer cell activity, um, 
in these subjects. Likewise, if you look, uh, you can see in case cell associated um, um, signaling mo molecules on the uh, surface of the um, mononuclear cells, the circulating mononuclear cells. So the um, NK G2D product and the PERF4 product are both markedly elevated by giving the stimulant. I just mention this because it's, a, it's an illustration or a confirmation that some things that actually are not getting into the systemic circulation, they're triggering in the gut or an immune response with gut associated immune system, they're triggering an immune response that helps boost up in case cell uh, interferon activity, other, other immune, uh, immune parameters. And so we've got some studies now going to try to evaluate how these might be clinically helping in, uh, as vaccine adjuvants or maybe in, uh, to side effects in tumor therapy and so forth. Um, here's another example. Of, uh, one of the earlier speakers mentioned terastilbene. Ter uh, we did a small clinical study at our, at our place just to evaluate terastilbene, which is kind of a resveratrol-type compound that comes from blueberries and uh, other fruits. And just to look at, uh, we're just looking at their effects on blood pressure and uh, lipids in, in patients that have hypercholesterolemia and uh, mildly elevated blood pressure. So we did a low dose, a high dose of the terastilbene, a low dose with a, with a uh, grapeseed extract, and then a placebo. And primar primarily, primarily measuring metabolic endpoints. And this study is still going on, or the analysis is still going on, but I just show you a, 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 a little bit of the results from this. Um, these are subjects that have, generally they have hypertension and they're using cholesterol medicines. Um, sorry. And so, administering the terastilbene for, uh, I, this was administered for a week again, um, we really didn't see any side effects. Uh, some very minor changes in chemistry parameters, but nothing serious at all. Uh, the main finding that we've seen so far is just a moderate lowering of blood pressure. So, the, especially with the high dose group, you get lowering of both systolic and especially the diastolic blood pressure. It seemed to be consistent, statistically significant. I'm just working on the lipids associated with this, but this just demonstrated, a, a, this was kind of a proof of concept to say, could we go in with natural products in the, in the clinic, do proof of concept studies to show that we can target, we can lower the uh, uh, blood pressure and lipids with these uh, supplements. Um, I want to talk for just a minute about botanical drugs. Um, I borrowed this slide from a colleague at the FDA that he presented last summer, talking about botanical the botanical IND process in the U.S. and, and uh, the uh, NDAs that have released so far. Um, these data are probably need to be updated, but uh, as of the end of last year, there are probably about 400, 430 INDs that are on file. Uh, not all of them are active, but, but uh, um, they are on file. And just to clarify, when someone has an IND, what it means is they are, they can go into the clinic and do the clinical studies. So uh, that doesn't mean they are doing it, but it means they have that, that clearance to go and do the clinical study. Of the ones that are active, about a third of these are commercial, about two thirds of these are just research INDs or proof of concept INDs. So they don't have a commercial sponsor at this point. And uh, about two thirds of them are single herb, and about a third of them are multiple herb. Most of them are in phase two. The ones that are in the clinic are mostly phase two. A few are now in phase three. And there have been, as Nicholas mentioned a little earlier, two NDAs have been 
approved, submitted and approved out of the IND process. Uh, I, I just thought it's interesting to compare these two NDAs that, that are, are out there because it, it, uh, it suggests two things to me. It suggests that the landscape in the U.S. for registering botanical drugs is slowly changing. It's, cha it's slowly changing, but it is changing. And I think the door is going to be opening for more botanical drug registrations. But another thing, it suggests that the mindset is changing quite a bit too. The first one that was released was a cultivated species. This was a topical product actually, for, uh, 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 green tea catechins. Um, uh, it's, it's a cultivated species on a few farms. Um, they they standard the, standardize these catechins by, by weight and they, I think they monitor uh, you know, total catechins and maybe even four individual catechins. Um, so it was a fairly, as botanicals go, a fairly simple process. But this next one that was approved is Crophelomer. Actually, as a wild species, there is no commercial cultivation. This comes from the resin or the uh, sap of, the, uh, of this tree uh, in South America. And there's really no there's no simple way chemically to standardize this. There are thousands, thousands of these oligomers, catechin uh, oligomers, and uh, so there's no really suitable way to give a good standardization. So what they're really doing is standardizing this by, by bioassay. And so this, this process, uh, while collected, impossible to standardize chemically, standardized biologically and they received the NDA for, for approval. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a small crack, but it's a crack. It's an opening of an opportunity, I think, for the uh, NDA process. And I'll just give you an example or two of how we want to try to tackle this. Think about uh, botanicals that modulate signaling pathways. Um, if you think about cancer, uh, in cancer signaling particularly, you see, I'm just giving you one example. This is not uh, meant to be inclusive or, or exhaustive in any way. But it's well known that some of the um, uh, cancer chemotherapy drugs will, uh, the tumor cells will activate NF-kappa B, turn on a lot of transcription, many transcription factors that amplify cell survival. So these, these cells escape the tumor effect by ramping up NF-kappa B and other transcription factors. And, and uh, it's been known for some time, now well established, that curcumin and um, some other natural products can interfere with these pathways, can block those escape signals, if you will, and amplify the effects of the tumor cell. Um, so our idea is how can we how can we understand better how natural products might intervene in some of these critical signaling pathways? So what we're trying to do, you know, cisplatin and docetaxel, what you're trying to do is kill the tumor cell. And that's good if you can do it, but the problem is it's been a very difficult problem uh, to, to selectively kill the tumor cells and to get 100% killing. You have resistance develop, you have cancer stem cells that are not that are not hit by the, uh, by the chemo. And you have a lot of side effects because you're hitting a lot of normal cells as well. So the question is, can we find natural products that will intervene with some of these signaling pathways, not to kill the cell necessarily, but to arrest the progression, to block an escape signal, to block invasion, to block metastasis, uh, something along this line. So what we tried to do, uh, I'll just skip, we tried to set up a battery of a dozen um, cancer known established signaling pathways uh, with, with uh, luciferase vectors so we can readily see how these signals are turned on in the cells and then see if we can screen against all of these with, their, with uh, their, either their natural inducer or something that mimics their natural inducer and then see if we can find natural products that will intervene there. So, so what this battery does, it tries to determine if the botanical can inhibit the activation of the tumor cell signaling pathway by inducing agents 
or in the case of FOXO or MIR21, where we're trying to we're trying to um, activate that by, with the with the battalion. Um, so here's just an example of what a plate looks like. These are just a plate of extra botanical extracts and what the uh, percent of the control activity is in, a, in all of these signaling pathways. And you can see a couple of interesting things. Here's a, here's a plant extract that pretty much hits all of these pathways, but it also hits this control vector. So this is probably just a generalized toxicity that, you're, that we're seeing. But you see others that will give good inhibition of specific pathways of AP1 or of NF-kappa B, um, hedgehogs and uh, other pathways like that. And, uh, and so this kind of data we've begun to generate with a lot of medicinal plants that have history of use in cancer. And here's one, uh, this is Mangista, which many of you would know about, I guess. We fractionated this, and here's a, here's a, you know, something on the order, I don't remember, something on the order of 40 fractions, 30 to 40 fractions uh, from, from Mangista, and we just tried to look at where the activity goes. And you see a band of activity down here, toxic across the board. So these are, including the controls, you see toxicity here. So these are generally cellular toxic. But there are other molecules that are in here that really spare the, the um, control vector and they give selective inhibition of some of these signaling pathways. So we're trying to isolate the actives from these, see if we can understand how those might be useful in, uh, in preparing uh, from either this plant or from others. Uh, here's another example of a plant where you get a, got a really good activity of the crude extract, different, different uh, solvent partitions of that extract, and it turned out that we had maybe three different classes of compounds in here that are hitting different pathways. So in that one plant, you see several different classes of compounds that are interfering with these signaling pathways. So our plan is to take these, go into, uh, confirm it in, in other tumor cell types, go into animal models and see if we can shape a formulation that may be coming from medicinal plants that have a history of use that we can make a logical intervention in, let's see, patients with prostate cancer or breast cancer or whatever it might be. Um, MIRNAs are an attractive target here. You can see uh, a lot of, we're, we're beginning to understand that um, microRNAs are playing key roles in many tumor cell types and signaling here. And it, it's very hard to deliver these uh, micro, uh, microRNAs because of stability and pharmaceutical issues. But now we know that some natural products actually upregulate these RNAs. Uh, this LET7, one of our colleagues uh, up at Wayne State University, Dr. Sarkar, has done some work on this, just taking natural products that can upregulate LET7. Uh, DIM, which is um, an indole from, from um, um, cruciferous vegetables from foods, you can get an upregulation of LET7. And actually, he's been able to take this to the clinic and show that in prostate biopsies, by, by treating people with this, with this uh, natural product derived from food, by treating them before surgery, they can actually get upregulation of this LET7, which is normally suppressed in prostate cancer, but they can get upregulation by giving this, uh, giving this uh, natural product. So it's those kinds of interventions, I think, that hold a lot of promise for uh, cancer as adjuncts in cancer chemotherapy or perhaps as agents that can be used alone. And I'm going to stop there, uh, just thank all of the colleagues that contributed to this work, and I thank all of you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Speak in their language, they will be able to understand what English you speak. So we are, we're trying to find our common ground where we could actually act as a translation between the two. Conventionally speaking, the Ayurveda and the natural uh, medicine is possibly ego medicine, which has uh, a different mechanism of understanding and research. 
and it is, in my opinion, a longitudinal research. It goes in, into families, traditions, ages, and all. Whereas uh, modern medicine is running into a horizontal thing. That means we are looking at uh, their uh, uh, footprints and seeing whether the targets are met or not. There are goods and bads of each tradition. The uh, footprints may change, just like antibiotics. There would be a new thing which would develop. We can have uh, resistances which would come, uh, come up, and uh, and it goes in cycles. So, for example, um, the cotrimoxazole, which was uh, getting resistance and all, and now today we know we are going back to cotrimoxazole. Most of the resistant bacteria are sensitive to uh, the original medicine. So. A lot of things go in cycles, which also is one of the handicaps of the modern medicine. I think uh, what we need to understand is how the plant medicine could be actually helping us in improving our way of life. So, uh, what's your comment on? Uh yeah, thank you. It's, it's definitely, it's definitely true that I've observed that or. or ruminated on this and we discussed about this at most all of these conferences about that gap. How do we, how, how do the two systems, how can we learn to speak the same language? But I think it's slowly changing. Uh, maybe not across the board. But I think in efforts like this that you described here and some of the others that we've had discussions with, I think it's slowly changing so that, you know, a few years ago, it was, uh, if you spoke about Ayurvedic medicine in the U.S. among conventional physicians, you know, you couldn't even, you couldn't even open the conversation. That's not, it's not that way anymore. Almost every med medical school in the U.S. at least has some type of orientation towards integrated medicine, even though it may not be, uh, you know, adequate and it may not be in depth from, from the perspective of the system, traditional systems, but they're still recognizing at least that there's something there that it needs to be explored, that we need to find ways to, to, um, um, to translate between the two languages. So I think it's slowly changing. What, what is, what's ingratiating or encouraging to me, I think, is that now we begin, we, maybe we have a long way to go, but now we begin this dialogue. And as long as there are people who are, who are uh, you know, objective enough to see the truth of the other side, no doubt we can come together, right? It's only when you shut the door that you can't come together. So I think, this, I think it's very hopeful to me. Thank you, Larry. I think uh, it's already one of the decorated with the Excellence Award by Wilman twice, and he is a Professor Emmer Job Memorial uh, Awardee, uh, and he has a distinguished career uh, in the contribution which he has made for the international pharmacopoeia at WHO level for the stability testing.